I'm not doing Can that. Can we do a dance? You should get us to do a TikTok dance. Welcome back to the Behind the Well Show. Here with Elias Randall in studio. How you doing to get today, Eli? I'm doing really, really awesome. I'm having a great day. Better than the other day we did this? You told me you just felt like you had a bad day. Yeah, you know when people talk about getting writer's block, I think whatever version of that is for when you're filming a podcast, I think that happened to me. That's okay. So today, as long as that doesn't happen, I'm happy with however the show goes. So, Well, this should be kind of an exciting show. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the ways in people – are now consuming financial information. And we've, we've hit on this, but 20 years ago, in fact, we did an interview with Mike Grimm, I don't know, probably like two months ago, right before uh, March Madness, talked about how people consume financial information. And, you know, the original way is you pull the newspaper out, you look at how the stock did, and then the next day you see how the stock did. And then it became your stockbroker calls you and you get a statement, and then it was the internet. Today, it's evolved into YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, and what we'll call social media platforms. And not everybody consumes their financial information that way, but it's definitely becoming much more mainstream. Yeah, it is. And I think it's, you know, to me, I'm kind of on, I'm in the boat that I think some of it's really good. And I think, here's the thing I think is is really good about social media platforms and Younger people are becoming more engaged. And now, whether the advice is good or bad advice, that's kind of a different topic. But if someone's young enough and they get started, and when you're young, you don't have enough money to blow up your situation, right? So even if you do follow a couple things that maybe aren't the best idea, I'm certain you start down the path, you're gonna end up you're gonna end up starting to consume the good financial information that is gonna teach you how to be a successful investor as opposed to maybe some things that aren't really the best advice. I think that's a very valid point. What's interesting though is most of these social media platforms didn't start as a place to get financial advice. It was a way to you know meet other people or interact, share stories, videos, or TikTok started off as a place to go for new dances get viral taco recipes, and now you can get your financial advice. So over the last year, the audience has TikTok, on TikTok has really grown to become more adults. Not that there's not kids, but adults too. And I first found out about TikTok because my, my niece, who's like 11, did a TikTok fan, dance. It's like a year ago. I go and check. I go and I, I went to the website and I watched it or the app, whatever they call it. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And then next thing you know, there's another one. And then there's another one. And 37 minutes later, I'm still watching TikTok dances. Yeah, one 60 minute or 60 second video at a time. <laughs> Turns it into 37 yeah. minutes. Um, and then definitely during COVID, people just became more and more embraced with technology because they kind of had to. But what was interesting is the hashtag personal finance is, is a compiled video set that has over 4.3 billion views on TikTok. Think about that. 4.3 million people have consumed some type of financial information on TikTok. And one of the issues with this, this information isn't regulated. You know, full disclosure, our broker dealer does not allow us to go onto TikTok and give financial information. And we jokingly talk about when markets are frothy or bubbles or all those different things that, you know, you're getting your financial information from your plumber, your roofer, cousin Eddie, whoever it could be. Yeah, your neighbor that you drink beer with in the garage. So the question is how is. valid is the information you're getting on TikTok? Um, and we're gonna actually look at some videos or listen to a couple of quick clips or talk about some TikTok videos and whether we actually think those are valid places or valid rationale for how to get some financial information today. All right, let's do it. So TikTok video on how to pick stocks. Want to see one way I pick stocks? Search which actively managed funds have the best five year performance. Generate a list of the best performing funds. Then do a search for the top performing fund. Click the fund, click on their top 10 holdings and see what they're holding. 
I've used this for years as a way to see what the world's best investors are buying. Follow and like. So the idea is I'm buying the stocks that the best mutual fund companies are buying. Okay, so in general, if you're going to look at an actively managed fund, and we're determining whether this is good advice or bad advice. Right. Right. Well, we clearly want to filter out who the best performers are the last five years. But ideally, if you were asking me, I'd say who has done this for 10 years or 20 years and showed a propensity to outperform an index? Because when you're buying any investment, there's always an index that you could buy today, right? You could buy an ETF, you could buy an S&P 500 index that kind of mirrors that fund. So I think searching out the performance is important, but there's a lot of other metrics. The challenge with then going and looking at the top company holdings for that mutual fund is by the time you buy the mutual fund, they may not hold those top holdings anymore because they don't have to report those daily. So if they say, hey, our top holdings were Apple and Tesla and um, IBM and Microsoft, by the time you buy it, they might not be in the portfolio. So you got to kind of look over what we call portfolio turnover, which is how often they turn over the holdings in that portfolio over a given year. So, yeah, so this is actually about picking individual stocks. Yeah. The problem with that is once again, if you're trying to mirror that mutual fund, by the time you buy the stock, it may it not be in a mutual fund. And if you're trying to go do that, why wouldn't you just go hire a fund manager to do it. So I have a good example of this. Right before I came in here, I was talking with Ron Pfeiffer in our office. He asked me, have you done any preparation for fantasy football? Because you know I'm going to play some fantasy football. <laughs> yeah. And we were talking about strategy. And he goes, hey, Raj, have you, you, know, have you, done, have you signed up for DraftKings or FanDuel? I'm like, yeah. Signed up last year. It was legal in Iowa. I thought I was just going to like hit a home run. You know, fantasy football guru. I'm not. Trust me. I don't have a good strategy like I do for baseball yet. I haven't figured out how to get that volume. But... That said, I go, Ron, when I signed up on on uh, FanDuel, I was able to play in the beginner arena for like the first four or 500 bucks. I did really well. I'm like, man, I'm good at this. And then they graduate you out of that, right? You're no longer <laughs> a beginner. And I got my butt kicked for like three or four weeks in a row. I'm like, I'm done. Like I'm losing a few hundred bucks a week. I'm not good at this. I started thinking about it. There are people who are making their living playing fantasy football, who are committing 50, 60 hours a week to setting lineups and analyzing everything from pass coverage and cornerback, wide receiver matchups, offensive, defensive line, all this, all these metrics that go into it, right? Just like a professional gambler would do. Why would I think I can beat those people? And this is no you, different. You probably shouldn't think that. This is no right? different than someone wanting to pick an individual stock. Unless you're going to commit 50 or 60 hours a week, why wouldn't you just hire a professional to do this for you? Yeah. So in general, I'm going to tell you this is bad advice. Trying to mirror a mutual fund that may not hold the stock any longer is not good advice. If you want to go find a good investment, go hire a financial advisor or investment management company or a mutual fund company, whatever it is, to just do it for you. I mean, you're he, this guy's telling you to just take their ideas. Well, why not just hire them? So that doesn't cost that much. That, that so, was my so that was my thought on it was you're looking at five year performance. So that's kind of to me that's a small time horizon five year performance. And then the other thing is is if it's such a good mutual fund, just buy the mutual fund. Your cost in buying that mutual fund is not going to be astronomically more than going to buy those stocks. And depending on what platform you're using, it might just be cheaper to buy the fund and pay the professional to make those decisions well, for you. Well, you're only quantifying cost by the pure cost of trading. You're right. not quantifying the opportunity cost that you're giving up by hiring a professional. You actually more than likely, and Vanguard has studies about this, they have a white paper that hiring a financial professional equates to about 3% a year in extra return versus doing this yourself. So, you know, that's great. You think you can go pick them long term? You can't. Anybody can pick a good stock when the market goes up, but show me over Correct. ten years a propensity to outperform a market. And I just don't believe the average investor can go pick stocks and win or beat an index or beat an active manager over ten years. I just don't think they can commit the time to it. Yeah. So that's a good segue into the the second video and the other point 
I was going to bring up about. So if you're going to find out, if you're going to search mutual funds and see their top 10 holdings, well, you could just buy an index that mirrors the S&P 500 and just move on and keep it simple. So then that ties into video number two, which this video was funny. Hey, John, what's the best stock to pick? All of them. Now, like, I want to start investing. Which stock should I pick? Oh, you're a beginner? Pick all of them. What do you mean pick all of them? I don't have the money to buy every single stock. Let's say you bought one share of VTI. Buying this one share is like owning 3,000 individual stocks. You'll own a tiny sliver of Apple, Microsoft, Amazon. If you bought one share of Tesla and they go bankrupt, you lose everything. If you bought one share of VTI and a company goes bankrupt, you still own 3,000 other companies that are making you money. So it's... It's a clip of a guy, he's dressed in two different costumes. So he asks, what's the best stock to buy? And then it's him answering the question in a different outfit saying all of them. And he's talking about there's an index and I don't know what, he didn't say which index. Um, I think it was maybe the Russell 3000. He said, you can buy an index out there where you own 3000 different companies. Right. Well, his point is, just buy a lot and be diversified and you're going to own winners and losers. But over the long term, you're probably going to win. I 100% agree with this. If you're a novice and you don't have a financial advisor, the default option is an index, right? Yeah. Because you don't have to determine what company is good and what company is bad. We own them all. And we had this discussion in my office about three or four weeks ago, dollar cost averaging. And I go, Elias, dollar cost averaging doesn't work for individual stocks. And he kind of looked at me like, doesn't work all the time. And here's why. Let's say you bought Sears in 2007 and you dollar cost averaged all the way. You dollar cost averaged yourself all the way to bankruptcy. You bought Macy's. You would have dollar cost averaged yourself all the way to bankruptcy, even though you're doing exactly what they tell you to do. You just keep getting a lower cost. Dollar cost averaging works when you buy an index. Because if you Correct. go look at the past track history of indexes over 5, 10, 15, and 20 years, they've always ended higher than they were 15 years before. So dollar cost averaging works in that index scenario. It doesn't work in individual stocks all the time. And it doesn't work all the time in index, but 99% of the time it has worked in an index, but not in individual stocks. So I think this advice is actually good advice because they're saying, hey, don't put all your eggs in one basket. You're not smart enough to really figure out you know, what the best stock is. And there's multiple people that agree with him. Watch Jim Cramer. He's an advocate of picking individual stocks, which I disagree with. But what he's telling people is go listen to the earnings call, determine based on what they say in an earnings call, whether this is a good stock, which most people aren't listening to an earnings call. They're watching TikTok. And most right. of these people watching TikTok, <laughs> the guy's going and seeing what the mutual fund's buying, and then he's buying that thinking that's a strategy, not a strategy. But secondly, he said, if you're buying your Roth IRA or whatever, S&P 500 index fund, Warren Buffett. There you go. Bet a, bet a hedge fund, he couldn't outperform the S&P 500 index after fees over 10 years. He lost. Boring sometimes is perfect. Yeah, well, and for our listeners, there's nothing wrong with just Buy in the market. If you buy the S and P 500 and you participate, history has shown us you're probably going to like the results. And you don't need to be, you really don't need to be so greedy and say I need to beat the market all the time. If if people think timing the market matters and buying individual stocks matters, they need to go to our website btwellshow.com and go look up our little case study we did on the worst investor. I'll have Molly post that on the website. And if you believe that you need to time the market or you need to pick the best investment, you're wrong. Yep. Yep. So number video number three. And I, I thought this was, I thought this was decent advice. I just thought it was too generic. So it was about renting versus buying a house. I'm moving out from my parents. Should I buy or rent a house? Well, many people think renting's a waste of money. Oh, okay, so I should buy it then. Well, on the other hand, buying it could also be a waste of money. Now I'm even more confused. What's the answer? You can probably save money by renting if you stay there three years or less. Any more than that, you might as well buy the house. Thanks, money, Dad. I always make him look so smart. The guy basically says, if you're going to live there for three years or less, rent the house. If you're going to live there for three years or more, you should probably buy. For me, the the decision to buy a house, I think it's more involved in that. I mean, if you're someone who 
if, if you're someone who doesn't want to be committed to one area, maybe you have a job that you could potentially live in one part of the country for five years, which is more than three, but then maybe move to a totally different part of the country, or maybe that's something that happens in your industry. Maybe renting is just something you should always do because you need the ability to just pick up and move when you want. Now, if you're committed to living in an area for a long period of time, buying a house is probably the way to go. Well, we've talked about this a lot. I don't believe your personal residence is an investment. I believe it's a Correct. place to live. So whether you rent or buy probably doesn't matter so much. But I believe the reason in this video they're talking about if you're going to be there three years or less, by the time you factor in closing costs on a house, all the stuff you have to do to get that house bought, and then you go and sell three years later and pay a realtor and you pay all the fees, all the closing costs again, they're looking at this purely from a financial standpoint. Correct. I would tell most people, if you're not going to be there for six years, I don't think that's a win. I don't think most of the time you can break even being in a house for three years, at least not in Iowa. Maybe there are parts on the East and West Coast, and if you happen to hit a crazy housing market like today, right? I mean, yeah, it could work out and it favor, could work out. But right. long term, I'd tell people even longer, like you should be committed to that house longer. Otherwise, just rent because renting's cheaper. You don't have taxes. You don't have maintenance. You don't have a lot of that stuff. You don't have the stickiness of a house. You don't have to sell it. Be stressed out if, oh, man, I hope I can sell this thing. And, oh, by the way, I got to pay this realtor 18 or 20 or twenty five thousand dollars to sell this place. And I have nothing against paying realtor fees. I think you should pay realtor fees. You have hire a professional to do it. But when you buy a place, you have to factor that into your decision making on whether you know you're going to stay there. If you say, "Oh, I don't know how long I'm going to stay here," you just rent. You can rent nice right. places. Yeah, and some of those points you just made about when you rent a place, you don't have the burden of maintenance that you have when you have your own house and fixing things when they break. And I mean, you have to contact someone to get them fixed. But if you don't want all those headaches. Just rent. A pl you, everyone needs a place to live, and not everyone ends up paying their house off eventually anyway. So I, I think it's okay to rent if that's what you want to do. If you want to buy a house, I think that's okay too. It's a little bit about life, lifestyle design. Yeah, I feel like it's more lifestyle than just a financial decision, I think, anyway. Buying a house for me never is a financial investment decision. It's always been, I want to live here, and this is what I want at the house, and I'm willing to pay for that or not. It's ever been, I'm going to do this because I think the resale's great. Right. I mean, right. I you either want the house or you don't. Either yeah. Right. I mean, if we're worried about resale, you're trying to make an investment. But the only way you ever realize that investment is by selling it and turning it into some type of a income generating asset, which most people don't do. I don't, you know, there are some people who, when they retire, they have a $500,000 house or 700 or whatever, and they sell it and buy a $300,000 condo. But most of those people... They buy a three hundred thousand dollar condo here, and they buy one in Florida. They don't take the three hundred and put it to market. <laughs> right. I see more people that have a three hundred thousand dollar place here and buy another house versus monetizing their house here and turning it into an investment. Right. So that goes back to my point. Your home is just a place to live, and I know your real estate agent. All these people are going to tell you how it's a great investment. It's not an investment. It is a place to live. Yep. Yeah. So. Video number four, and I'm just, I'm going to spill the beans on this one. This is bad advice. <laughs> You're going to turn $100 into a million dollars in one year just by doing this. What we're going to do is I'm going to teach you how to trade options in the stock market with proper risk management and trading large companies such as Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Tesla, Amazon, and so on. No penny stocks, no small stocks. We're going to trade large companies and we're going to aim for 20% return every single week. In the options world, it is very doable to do it. So what we're going to do is $100 turns into $120, then $144, then $172 by week four doing 20% consistent gains. And by the end of the year, a million dollars in your account. This is very doable, but you have to learn how to trade options with proper risk management. And I'm here to teach you strategies on how to do options and how to do it properly and how to do it for all beginners if you know nothing about the stock market, right? All you need to do is click on my profile, subscribe to my website. You get a welcome email with my free groups links. We have over 34,000 members and we're all here to help. So I'll see you in there. I don't even need to know what it's talking about. I'm reading that. Read the headline. So, it's bad advice. Yeah. The title of the video, you can turn $100 into $1 million in one year. 
huge red flag. And so what this guy's doing, he's selling a class to teach people how to trade options. Well, he shows a chart that shows you start with $100 and then a 20% compounding return for 52 weeks in a row and you end up with over a million dollars. I bet there's a lot of options traders out there that it doesn't quite work that way for. I'm sure it doesn't work that way. It could have worked that way for one or two. Vast majority of the people will not turn $100 into a million. It goes back to the number one rule. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. You know, when I was on my trip up north to Lake of the Woods fishing, one of the guys there is a poker player. And it reminds me of this famous saying in poker, if you can't spot the sucker, <laughs> you are the sucker. And that's I've, what this is. If I've you believe there. you're going to turn $100 into a million, you're the bait. Like, you're the prey. So well, don't believe then, that. This is horrible advice. I mean, realistically, look at what markets have done over time. 10, 11% a year, right? I mean, historically, the stock market returns. 20% a day? I mean, 20% a day, we'd all quit our day jobs. If it was this easy, we'd buy a video, we'd quit our day jobs. I'd be worth $50 million before I knew it. <laughs> yeah. It's not that easy. But it goes back to when you consume financial information, what is the agenda of this person, right? We have an agenda here. What's our agenda? Help people create a financial plan to provide, put, to move them into the probabilistic world of investing. Right. Their financial advice, financial agenda in this video is one thing to sell a course for them to generate revenue. Maybe the hundred dollars that he put into creating the video is how he made the million. Well, Maybe it wasn't even through options like, hey, yeah. build a video for a hundred bucks and sell it to enough people and you get a million dollars. Yeah. And the other thing I'll point out just right away when you see something like this, okay, you can turn $100 into $1 million. So if this guy was marketing to serious options traders, that wouldn't be the tagline. Maybe it'd be turn a million dollars into $50 million, but he's marketing to people that one can only afford $100. And then I'm sure if you click on the link in the video, you have to pay him $1,200 to learn the strategy. $24.99 a month or $9.99 <laughs> a month. And right. I forgot I had the subscription and it's impossible to cancel. <laughs> yeah, I tried to cancel the subscription the other day. I'm like, how do I do this? It's like four bucks. I couldn't figure out how to cancel it. You know what most people do? Just keep it. Keep it rolling. Yep. So the next one. What's a piece of information that you learned that feels illegal to know? Probably if you're an American citizen, you actually have the right to look up and see which stocks rich people, CEOs, CFOs, people that are high up in companies are buying and you're allowed to copy it. So I'm going to show you the website I use because I made 17% on a stock in just one day today. So. Okay, so all you have to do is go to this website right here, Open Insider, click on this button that says Charts, and it's going to show you the blue right here is when rich people are buying a bunch of stocks, and the red is when they're selling it. So back when COVID hit, they started buying up a bunch of stocks, and then they all went up in value, and now they're selling them. So yeah, it seems like it would be illegal to view this, but it's not. So this one, it says, buy the same investments that rich CEOs buy. So apparently there's a website where you can research what investment CEOs hold or rich people are buying and copy their investment holdings. So I don't know, right? When I watched this one, I thought, you know, this could be decent advice, but here's one thing. There's a difference between accumulating wealth and then once you're already wealthy and you're rich, there's a difference in how you invest to get to those places. At least I think, because rich CEOs, their their main goal is to just stay wealthy. I would think most of the people consuming advice on TikTok are trying to accumulate wealth. I think that's a great point. But at the same, the other thing to remember, so-called rich people, which define rich, I don't know what that is. It's some level of wealth that is undefinable by this. Correct. At the same token, they can afford to take risks that the everyday person can't take. And what I mean by that is if you've got, you know, 
George Soros and however many billions of dollars, he can throw 500 million at something. And if it doesn't work out, it's not the end of the world. Right. If the average Joe takes all of their retirement savings and follows what a wealthy investor is doing, he may be taking undue risk. And it goes back to my personal philosophy. We don't need to buy individual stocks to be successful. I know why all these TikTok videos are being created because people are all looking to get rich quick. Everybody since the beginning of time has wanted to get rich quick. The shiny object. How do you get rich yeah. in investing? You buy a little bit for a long period of time in investments that shown a propensity over 10 and 15 years to do very well. That's the easiest way to get wealthy. It's not to find the next big shiny object. I'll never forget a friend of mine 15 years ago approached me and said, hey, I want you to look at this investment. And I'm not going to use names of who it was with. And he's wealthy. He already has wealth. I looked him right in the eye and said, you only need to get rich once. You don't need to do it twice. So don't why would you buy your this? toe and blow up your situation. So I said, I said, you don't need to get rich twice. Right. You've already made it. Why would you even consider this? I mean, it was a high risk investment, obscure company, right? In the, you know, initial building phase. Yeah, it might work out and you become more wealthy, but is that going to change your life? Right? Oh, you have 10 million and you get another million. Does it matter? But if you have hmm. 10 million and you go to two, that you're matters. still okay, but it matters. And or if you have a hundred thousand and you're thirty five years old and you do something risky and you go to ten, that matters. Yeah, that's a big step back. Right. Right. So, you know, once again, I'm not going to a website to figure out what rich people are buying because they're in a different situation than me. They have different information than me. It doesn't mean that that couldn't work out, but I I'm gonna call this bad advice. The reason these people are making these TikTok videos, they're trying to get subscribers and followers because they want to make money from their TikTok right, videos. TikTok. If they went and talked about boring index strategies and financial planning like we do, they're not gonna get as many followers because we're not exciting. We're boring. We've had people tell us we're boring. You know, unfortunately for our clients, we are boring. It works out pretty that's good. That's kind of what we're selling to people. <laughs> so that that's a good segue to number six. How to retire a millionaire. If you're between the age of 18 and 25, and you live in the USA. Step one, open a Roth IRA. You can do this by going to betterment.com, clicking get started, invest for retirement, not currently retired. How old are you? Let's say 18. Annual pre-tax income, six grand, cause you're 18. Type of retirement account, Roth IRA. Click continue, drop a spicy email, get you a strong password. Just finish filling all this out, open an account. When you're done, you'll be good to go. Step two is earn or obtain $250 a month. Then contribute that to your Roth IRA. By contributing only $250 a month from the age of 18 all the way down to 65. And if you do $500 a month from 18 all the way down to 65, maybe you're balling on a budget, $100 a month. Not bad. So you don't start till 25, 500 a month. Still looking good. And that money is all tax free. Seriously, it's, it's tax free. It was how to become a millionaire by retirement. And basically the person in this video says, open a Roth IRA when you're 18 and contribute at least 250 a month. That's good advice. I, and I actually, I think if you were to do that, if you were to do 250 a month into the market for the last, just the S&P 500 for the last 40 years, you would have more than a million dollars. Yeah, I'm sure you would. We've run the scenarios. I yeah. don't want to quote any numbers or anything, but this is the way to become wealthy. Yeah. Start at a young age and contribute a little bit of money over a long period of time. And I would add to this though, start with 250. And when you get your raise of 3% each year, take 1% and put it in the, you know, max this Roth IRA out and then become ultra wealthy. The other really thing I like about this video is they said do it in a Roth IRA, mm -hmm. which they're moving towards this known tax code. It's the only known tax code in America. Our tax code is completely unknown from year to year. We think it's known. It's not. The only known tax code today is the Roth IRA. It's a 0% future tax code. So for young people, this is one of the best videos that I've seen on this topic because they're making it simple. This is the way to become a millionaire, not following what CEOs are doing or doing what mutual fund people are doing. Just go buy a boring investment that's done well over the last 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years, right? There's companies out there who have done very well the last 50 years. 
I'll believe in those companies. Yeah. And do 250 bucks a month, put in a Roth IRA, things will tend to take care of themselves. Yeah, I I totally I agreed with that. I thought that video that was that's good, solid. It's boring advice, but it is good advice. Okay, so video number seven was called The House Hack. Here's a life hack that's gonna save you tons of money that they didn't teach you in school. Okay, so most people buy a single family home and have to pay $2,500 a month for their mortgage. They get no tax deductions and no write-offs. Instead, use the house hacking strategy and buy a multi-unit property. Live in one unit for a year and rent out the others. If you charge $2,500 a month for each of the units, that's $7,500 a month, which should cover the cost of your total mortgage. You might be too young to buy a house now, but you'll buy a house one day. Be sure and save this video. Uh, once again, I thought this was good advice, but I think it's specific for a certain demographic of person or someone who wants to take this on. Basically, instead of buying a single family home, buy a multi-unit property, live in one unit, rent the other units out. So to me, it's like, yeah, great idea. Sounds great up front, but you have to be someone who's willing on to take on the extra responsibilities of the other units when a light bulb goes out, when the furnace filter needs change, when the sink in the bathroom starts leaking. So yeah, good, ho good house hack, probably for a specific person. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I'm going to, I'll call it good advice as yeah. long as you understand what you're getting into. Because, so I'm going to use my scenario. I would never do this. I'm not good at the power tool. I can't do plumbing. I don't fix things. Okay. Like I find people to fix those things. So if you're a person who has to hire somebody to fix all the problems that could arise, arguably this might not be the play for you unless you've got a buddy named Brad. Well, yeah, if you have a friend who can <laughs> And do I know he's work. watching this show, but... In general, if you can fix things, this could be a good play. I, I have a friend of mine, actually named Brad, not the same Brad, but another friend, who did this. He had bought a property. He lived on the bottom floor, rented out the top, and it helped him build equity in the first house. Eventually, he sold that house and moved on from it and bought just a house for him and his wife that they don't rent um, because he was just tired of the headaches and the upkeep. Remember, if you decide to do this, this is kind of like another job. Right. Yeah. So if you're working 60 hours a week somewhere and then you think you're going to come home and relax, probably not going to happen. You're going to have to upkeep this property. We had a guy in our office who works here. He used to own like 27 or 40, re 40 rental properties. He doesn't own any today. <laughs> yeah. He was tired of dealing with it. Yeah. So I'm not saying it's not a great idea. It might, especially if you're kind of on the edge of affording it. Right. Some people push that budget. It might be a great way to kind of help get some revenue. The other mm -hmm. pe thing I'll caution people on this, if you decide to do it, make sure you can afford it without the renter. Yeah. Because yep. I, I don't know what the statistics are, but I want to say like rental properties like are only like rented like 90, 80 or 90% of the time. Yeah. They're going to so, be empty at some point. Right. So they're going to be empty at some point. You need to factor in what the cost is to maintain it. Now that cost to maintain it may be the same cost just for you to maintain your place too. Um, so I'm not gonna call it bad advice, it's good advice if you understand your relationship with fixing things, plumbing, electrical, siding, and your propensity to want to do that. Yeah, so me, I can, I could do it. I can fix those things, I'm fairly handy. I don't want to, I have no desire to spend my time doing that. So for me, it's this would be good advice, but I'm not gonna do it because I got enough going on in my own house that I don't want to take care of that I have to. <laughs> I hire all my stuff done. Why would I go <laughs> right. buy another one, do all the work there and none for myself? So, I mean, it's good advice if you're a person who wants to go tackle that. Yep. So video eight, we're on the verge of a crash. Tell me that the market is about to crash without telling me that the market is about to crash. Three facts, here we go. One, the Buffett indicators at all time highs. Look at where we are now compared to the previous bubbles. As you can see, we are way above the mean trend line. Two, record levels of debt. Check out corporate debt to GDP. Three, we have to keep printing money, otherwise everything crashes. Which puts the Federal Reserve in a catch-22. Either they stop printing money and let everything crash, or they keep printing money, keep the can down the road, and hope for the best. So I'll stop you right there. Yeah. So, bad advice. We don't predict yeah. markets. Market predictions, eventually they'll be right. We don't know when they're going to be right. right. I mean, eventually mm -hmm. the market's going down. I just don't know when. So here's the problem with predicting. You gotta be right twice. 
have to be right when you sell, and you have to be right when you buy. Most people are twice or wrong twice when they sell and when they buy. <laughs> yeah, true. they sell at the bottom, they buy at the top. Yeah, and, so. and that's so. It's just in general bad advice. Um, I mean, I think the bottom line is like every other media outlet out there. There's some good information, some not so good information. We've talked about how to disseminate and kind of filter out media. Personally, I'd be trying to vet these people on TikTok. Like, what's your background? Because if your background was 12 months ago, I was a bartender at the Union Station, and now I'm making TikTok videos, well... I don't know. I, I think on one of these videos, you mentioned you knew somebody. Yeah. So actually, speaking of that, when we were looking at this outline, I actually know one of the people I graduated from college with him who made a video that we watched for this. Would you take advice from somebody who was overweight on how to become fit? Or would you take advice from someone who was single on how to be in a relationship? Of course you wouldn't. Then why do you listen to family and friends who are not financially successful give you advice on finances? If you take their advice, you have their life. I didn't even know he was making TikTok videos. He's got a lot of YouTube subscribers and TikTok subscribers. And basically the gist of it was don't take advice from family and friends who are not financially successful. So, you know, this is probably pretty good advice. Um, I guess it depends on your idea of, um, you know, what uh, being financially successful is. But that is, you know, just like the video we just talked about, we're on the verge of a crash. Well, that person, yeah, they showed some videos of, indicators being at all time highs and stuff, but that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean we are going to have a correction in the market. Now, eventually we will, eventually the market will come down. But to me, whenever that gets brought up, the bottom line of that is, is there's never been a time in our history that if you had a good diversified portfolio, that the market going down was actually a relevant event in the long term. In the short term, it's very relevant because no one likes it. It doesn't feel good. So I'm going to just piggyback on the video you talked about with your the person you know. Don't take advice from family and friends who are not financially successful. I would actually go further. Why would you take advice from anybody who doesn't have a background in finance? Right? General advice from family and friends is fine, but why not seek out professional guidance? I mean... People pay to get their teeth cleaned. They pay to go to the dentist. You pay to have your taxes done. You pay for insurance. You pay for all these different services, but you're going to try to do arguably one of the most important things in your life, which is put together your finances so that you can be financially independent one day. You're going to try to figure that out in your own. Yeah. Well, like, and we talk. If, if you're trying to do your investments on your own, you should be doing your taxes on your own because does it really matter? Yeah. And it, I mean, you plug it in some software, but you're, you're going to do your taxes on your own or you're going to do investments on your own, but you're not going to hire someone to do this. It's just crazy to me. Um, so in general, I just don't take advice from people that don't have a background in financial planning or in the investment world. Um, but like we said, like every other financial media, there's some good and bad advice. We need to have a media filter to figure out what the good and, good and bad advice is. Remember, anybody can post in this app. So literally, it could have been the guy who was bartending last week trying to create a following. Um, yeah. Most of these videos, I think Molly told me they have to be under 60 seconds. So how much information are you really getting in 60 seconds? Just enough to like get curious, yeah, right? Yeah, just enough to, um, to whet your appetite a little bit. And just because it could be good advice doesn't mean it's good advice for you. Well, and that's another good point. Good advice may not be relevant for your situation. The best advice someone could do in one of these videos is consult your investment person, your professional, get a financial plan done. And that's arguably the best investment advice you'll get. So with that said, I appreciate everybody listening. Until next time, uh, go to our website, btwellshow.com if you need any help or if you're looking for any information.